God's word today, and uh, bear with me. I'm working through uh, a cold or a flu or I don't know, uh, whatever it is. Anyway, I know where your head's at. I don't have that, but uh, I'm... Our... <laughs> okay, uh, <clears throat> but let's, let's hear from the Lord today, and I need to be your pastor today. And, and what I mean by that is sometimes I'm your preacher, and sometimes I'm your pastor. And, and, and so it, it's good to come in church and hear good revelation and all that stuff, but I really want to lean in and, and, and lead you and shepherd you through God's word today. I really want to teach you God's word uh, because the stakes are high in regards to this message. At every location, there is a reserved seat somewhere in your auditorium. My reserved seat is right here, and I want to ask you some questions today they are going to ponder and evoke some emotion around these empty seats. I want to talk to you about eternity. And I don't always do this, and, and uh, you know, obviously it's not a topic we're talking about every week because you'd be miserable and uh, it would be dreary, but sometimes we just got to talk about stuff. And I really want to help you think around what happens when you die. Do you think about that ever? Anybody? Think about what happens, like when life is over, what happens? And when I was growing up, they would tell us like heaven, like we'd just be worshiping all day. And like at first I'm like, that's cool. But like day two, like Jesus, I don't know what else to say to you or sing to you. Anybody thought that before? It's like, Lord, I done said it all. You know, like I love you. You're majestic and wonderful and beautiful. Like I got nothing else. Can we take a nap? Um, you know, and then there was this old cheesy, I was trying to find the video this week, but I couldn't find it, but it was this cheesy song by Audio Adrenaline. It was in the 90s. It was called My Father's House. Anybody heard of it before? That's how you know you've been saved for a minute, if you know this song. All right, like you're so saved, you're not religious, okay? You're, bar- you're not even saved. That's how saved you are, okay? And, uh, and so it says this, it says, <laughs> I'm gonna get in trouble today. It's a big, big house uh, with lots and lots of room. It's a big, big table with lots and lots of food, a big, big yard where we can play football. It's my father's house. That sounds palatable, doesn't it? Like I can get with that. Lots of food, lots of football. Uh, I'm with it. But when you think about eternity, okay, like your mind cannot construct and fathom the extent of how long that is. When you think about like just it never ending, does that freak you out a little bit? Let me encourage you with something. The scriptures say that no eye has seen and no ear has heard what God has prepared for those who love him. So in other words, we could spend a lot of time trying to interpret the scriptures, some of it metaphorical around what eternity is, but I don't know if that really fully helps us. What you need to understand about heaven and what you need to understand about eternity is there will be great glories and unbelievable, unthinkable, incredible experiences surrounded by the presence of God that so fulfills and frees us. No eye has seen, no ear has heard as to what God has prepared for those who love him. I can't wait to be there because I know it's going to so blow away my expectations. So if you're worried today about how long we're going to sing or if there's going to be food or football, I think you need to take that off of your mind. Really what we need to be worried about, listen to me, what we need to be thinking about is the people who are not sitting in these seats. Because is it possible, according to the scriptures that I'm going to prove to you over the next few moments, is it possible that if there is an eternity in heaven, there could be an alternative in eternity? Is it possible? I mean, would the cross, would the resurrection, would what we preach actually make sense if there was no consequence for the sin? No, it doesn't make sense. And the scriptures tell us in Ephesians that he raised us from the dead, otherwise we were spiritually dead, along with Christ and seated us, say with me, with him in the heavenly realms because we are united with Christ Jesus. So you and I were raised from the dead along with Christ and then seated with him in the heavenly realms. So in other words, what Paul is suggesting in the original language around seated actually means completed. 
So what happened was, is when Jesus died for you and for I, when he paid the ultimate price, there was a completion so that you could have a seat. There was a completion so that you would then be offered sonship and daughtership. There was completion that you would be offered power, you would be offered an anointing, you would be offered favor, you would be offered an abundant life and an eternal life where you never die. The, the, the challenge then though uh, for believers and the challenge then for us today is what happens to the people who are not seated the way that you and I have been seated. What happens to the people who are not seated in that reserved seat? When we don't take our commission and our opportunity and we don't take what we've been given seriously. Because we say we believe all this and we say we experience the love of God and the mercy of God and the grace of God, yet we're not giving it away. You've been given a seat, yet we've not given that seat to other people. So the title of my message today is what happens when they die? What happens when they die? And I understand, look at me, I understand that this message, this message could invoke uh, some, maybe triggers you a bit. Maybe you think about people who have passed, that guilt could be associated, whatever it is. There's nothing you can do about what's been done. And also, we don't fully understand the magnitude of God's grace, thank God. All we can do is focus on what's today. So I rebuke the spirit of anxiety and guilt and fear and shame. We've got to live for this moment in that empty seat. So what happens when they die? I want to ask you four questions today. Four questions. Here's the first one. And this is a general one. What happens when you die? Now, this is general. I'm not asking you specifically, but just in general. When a human dies, what happens? Everybody know the Apostles' Creed? You know, it's really, it was originally written or mentioned in AD 390, adopted by the church in the fourth century. It boils down our theology, right, our doctrine in basically a statement. So all of us who've ever been to a Bible teaching church, uh, most of our theology has been built around this paragraph, this statement. I believe in God the Father, I believe in God the Son, I believe in the Holy Spirit, you know, three in one, I believe in the virgin birth, yada, 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 right? At the end of the Apostles' Creed, it says, I also believe in the forgiveness of sins and the resurrection of the body and the life everlasting. I, I believe in the resurrection and life everlasting. So the whole basis of our theology is built around this idea, this concept that there is life after death. So again, if there's life after death, what happens to you? Where do we go? In Hebrews 9.27, the scriptures say this, and just as each person is destined to die once, and after that comes judgment. Okay, that word judgment, here's what it means. It's simple. How did I live? Have I received and believed in Christ, or have I rejected and disbelieved? Have I received and believed? How did I live? In other words, your eternity, how you spend eternity and where you spend eternity, those are two different things I don't want to get in today. But ultimately, judgment is, did I believe or did I not? So what I'm saying is, is judgment leads to eternity with God or eternity separated from God. And I want to talk about heaven for a moment and eternity with God. Let's go to the scriptures. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live. You see that? even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Okay? Next. And then this is Philippians. But our citizenship is in heaven and we eagerly await a savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ. So what the scriptures are saying is, is if I die, but I believe, I keep living. Is everybody on the same page? Also, Paul then says that my citizenship is in heaven. Like I'm here on earth for a short 
period of time. I'm here to accomplish a mission. I'm an ambassador to earth. I'm from heaven. I am first a citizen of heaven more than I am an American citizen, right? My, my, my responsibility to the kingdom of God is before my responsibility as a servant of my nation or of my city. But because I'm a citizen of heaven, I'm driven and I'm compelled to be a better servant and ambassador to my city and my nation, as everybody understands. Okay, so heaven, very clear in the scriptures that there is, if we believe there is life, our soul lives on. But what about the other side? What about hell? Here's what C.S. Lewis says. There is no doctrine which I would more willingly remove from Christianity than this, if it lay in my power. But it has the full support, talking about hell, of scripture and especially of our Lord's own words. It has always been held by Christendom and it has the support of reason. So this is C.S. Lewis, right? Brilliant author, theologian, all of these different things saying, I wish that hell did not exist. And I want you to feel and sense something today. If you have a desire for people to experience justice, or you're saying, oh man, I can't wait for this person to burn in hell, that posture is dangerous, it's sinful, and it's not the love of God. I don't care how bad somebody's hurt you or failed you or how much you hate a certain figure. The idea of hell should burden you and break you down. It should be something we wish did not exist. However, in Luke 16... The Greek word Jesus uses referencing hell is basanos, which means going to the bottom. Eternal darkness, torment, torture. In Revelation 20, eternal darkness and lake of fire. In Romans 6.23, the wages, the answer of sin is death. Ultimately, listen to this, hell is a form of eternal death as opposed to heaven being a form of eternal life. Now, Here's the good news. I asked you what happens when people die. Okay. What happens when people die is they either spend eternity with God, present with God, or separated from God. Those are really the only two places where our souls live on. It's either death without God, an unawareness of his presence, an absence of his glory, of his goodness, of his love, of his mercy, or it's hope. The good news, just so you understand that God is not evil and horrible, God did not create hell for people. Everybody see this. God did not create hell for people, and I'll prove it to you in Matthew. Then he will say to those on his left, depart from me, you who are cursed into the eternal fire, prepared or built, built for the devil and his angels. Do you see that? That hell was not built for humans, it was built for the devil and his angels. So I want to be very clear to you today that hell was not designed for any human. And we will talk about that here shortly. But I want to be very clear, hell was not made for you. It existed because the enemy, because Satan chose to reject God's love. He chose instead to make himself more glorious, more powerful. He chose to be his own God, which is exactly what we do in society. We say we want to be glorified. It's our, we are not submitted to God our Father. Therefore, we're choosing a sense of our own godliness. What happens when people die? It's either eternity with God or it's separation from God. Now, again, I don't want to get into the depictions of what hell is or isn't. Gnashing of teeth or weeping or lake of fire, all these different ideas are fine. I'm not trying to get into all of those different metaphors. The point that I'm making is, is this. Hell is separation from God and the scriptures over and over and over again, in fact, Jesus talks about hell more than he talks about heaven, shows and alludes to the fact that there is eternity separated from God. And the question that we're asking today is who's not sitting in this seat? who is on that direction. You have been offered grace, Christian. You've been offered mercy, Christian. You've been offered love, Christian. You've been offered way more than you deserve, yet someone sits without God. What happens when you die? It's either heaven or it's hell. 
Here's the second question I want to ask today. Did Jesus really die for you? Did Jesus really die for you? Remember earlier in our church, uh, I don't know if somebody asked one of our leaders this or something, and they, they were asking if we baptized animals. And because this individual wanted us to baptize their cat. Yes, you heard me, their cat. Now, early on, man, you know, before the church started, I mean, we were kind of desperate for people and stuff. So I'm like, I considered it. I'm like, hey, you're going to bring your, your neighbors who have cats? I don't know. Like, I wasn't going to do it, though. The point I'm making is this, is while Jesus didn't die for everything, okay, I hate to break it to some of you cat lovers, definitely didn't die for your cat. My dog's going to hell for sure. <laughs> like, I've given up. Okay. Well, he didn't die for everything. He did die for everyone. He did die for everyone. Now, I'm not trying to get in some sort of theological debate around Calvinism or, you know, elected people or anything. But, like, if we look at the scriptures, in fact, Mark 16, 15, look what it says. And then he told them, and that them is us, go into all the world and preach the good news to everyone. In other words, in your context, go into all the world and, and bring them into an atmosphere where the good news is being spoken. You be good news. You don't act a fool at your workplace or at your house. And then you come and you bring people and you invite them to sit with you where the good news is being showered over them. But then also if we go to Matthew 24, 14 and John 1, 21 and John 3, 17 and John 3, 16 and 2 Corinthians 5, 19. I mean, we go through the scriptures, go into all the world. Christ died for everyone is reiterated over and over and over and over and over again. So again, I'm not trying to get into all the different tension points of theology, but I rather lean on the side that Christ died for everyone and that I have a responsibility to put people in a place where they hear the good news than to just say, oh, well, God will deal with them or God will deal with it. In fact, I'd say to you and submit this to you that if we believe that God didn't create hell for anyone, then we must believe God is offering heaven to everyone. If we believe that God, listen to me, listen to me, those of you who are mad and bitter at somebody, if we believe that God didn't create hell for anyone, then we have to believe that Jesus died for anybody. And that goes for the people who wronged you and the people who cursed you and the people who divorced you and the people who stole from you and the people who failed you and the people who broke you down. Do you understand that Jesus died for them too? How dare us receive the grace of God and go to God and ask for forgiveness and experience the goodness of God and his presence, yet withhold what God has done for us from somebody else because we're mad at somebody or because somebody failed us or because somebody lied to us. Jesus died for them too. And he died for some people that you're mad at, and he died for some people in jail, and he died for some politicians you don't like, and he died for some people that are already dead. Do you understand that Jesus died for everyone? And the posture and the attitude that I get God, but somebody else shouldn't or doesn't because of how they are or how they treated me, that is anti-gospel. There's an empty seat. It's reserved, and it's for your enemies. I'm preaching to somebody today. It's for your neighbor who keeps making your house dirty. <laughs> Jesus died for them too. For your teacher who's made you feel little. For your father who was never there, who's made it difficult for you to connect with your father God. I mean, I can go on and on. Jesus died for everyone. And the thing is, is in Romans, the scriptures say that he was handed over to die because of our sin, but he was raised to life to make us right with God. So as we celebrate Easter, we're celebrating the fact that like it's the resurrection. He died, but also he was raised to life. And our response is that we bring others to experience that same resurrection. But if you 
look at Psalm 119 and Psalm 25 and 1 John 4, here's what we see. Because some of us still think that God is crooked and some of us think that God is rude and he's mean. He's a bigot. But can I show you something in the scriptures that our sin demanded a guilty verdict? Stay with me. But the offering of Jesus instead proves that God is good, that God is just, and that God is love. How do we know that? Well, God was good because when you weren't and when you were a sinner and when you hated God and when you were an enemy of God, God offered his love to you and forgave you. He offered his son to you. God is good when you weren't. God is just because there had to be a price that was paid for your sin. So the spotless lamb, which was Jesus, had to be slain so that the blood would cover you. God is just. And he's also loved because he gave, God so loved, so he gave what was most valuable to him, for, to him, his son, to you and I. He's good because when we weren't, he was. He's just because he offered a sacrifice. And he's loved because he loves us so that he gave what was most valuable to him, to you. So to answer the question, what happens when you die? There's heaven and eternity with God or there is separation from God. But thankfully, Jesus died for all of us. And because Jesus died for all of us, it proves that God is good and he's just. He's perfect. He's love. So number three, here's the question for you. Where will you spend eternity? Don't be distracted. Don't check out. Don't pull up your cell phone. <coughs> Stay with me. Where will you spend eternity? I mean, that's the most important question I could ask you. At any moment, guys. At any moment, eternity can be begin for any one of us. I mean, I, again, I'm not trying to trigger you, but like this Kobe Bryant thing got me freaking out. At any moment. The scriptures say that we are not promised tomorrow. We have today. So where will you spend eternity? Here's what Matthew says. It says, therefore, the one who confesses and acknowledges me, this is Jesus before men as Lord and Savior, affirming a state of oneness with me, that one I will also confess and acknowledge before my Father who's in heaven. So if I believe and I confess... I'm good, but the one who denies and rejects me before men, that one I also deny and reject before my Father who is in heaven. Do you see the correlation? If you want to be sure, then you believe. You don't reject. So I want to be very clear about something, and I want to go back to the board for a moment. It's actually you who decides where you spend eternity. It's your choice. Ultimately, your belief in Christ as God or your rejection of him as God determines where you'll spend eternity after you die. Does everybody see this? Every location, every person listening, what I'm suggesting and what I'm saying according to the scriptures and what I just read is I actually choose. I believe in Christ as God or I reject him. I mean, and that's the bottom line. I believe or I reject. Which begs the question, how then could a just God send anyone to hell? And would God send someone to hell whom never had a chance to hear of him? Because unless you hear the gospel, unless you hear the good news, how can you believe? That's where we come in. That's where we say to those in our lives, come sit with us. That's where we don't act a fool at work or at school or in our neighborhood. So when people see us, they don't say, oh, they're just like everybody else. They see Christians and say, I want what's going on inside of them. Yeah. Yeah. You might be the only good news somebody ever sees, reads, or hears. But how could a just God send anyone to hell? Or someone who didn't know? Well, Romans, here's what Romans tells us, that the wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of people who suppress the truth by their wickedness. 
since what may be known about God is plain to them because God has made it plain to them. Now, next slide. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made so that people are without excuse. Does everybody hear that? That people are without excuse. Why? Because the word revealed means to make known. In other words, God has promised that through his people, through our internal conscience, or to, through our external experience of the cosmos and the planets and the glories, people have no excuse because God absolutely has made himself known. If you look at humanity and how it functions and how we reproduce and how we breathe from what has come from the ground and all of the different beauties of it, I really believe that God absolutely complements the sciences that we discover. That you look around and you look outside and you look at our world and yes, a lot of issues that have a lot to do with sin, but when you look at the base of it and the goodness of it and the fact that we can fly and the fact that we have planets and it's so far beyond we could ever ask, think, dream, imagine, fathom, understand, like God is that vast and that good. But even further, there is an internal God DNA inside all of us. Where we know and we really ask ourselves, we know when good is good and when bad is bad and when truth is truth and when lies are lies. And like we're born with a sin nature which proves our God DNA. And if you don't believe that we're born with a sin nature, then you've never had a toddler in your life. (laughs) Because when you say no and then they look at you and smile... And they know that they're about to get a spanking or a timeout, and they choose instead to do the wrong thing. You know that there's a God DNA and a devil at work. <laughs> like, you know. Because in all of us, there's an eternal clockwork. It's a conscience. We're without excuse, but the reality is how can they know if somebody doesn't tell them in the scriptures, say, beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. Are you bringing good news? Are you filling a seat? Are you telling somebody? Are you living a life that reflects the goodness and the glory of God in your life? Where will you spend eternity? Do you believe? I don't want to make a statement. And I believe this, that according to the scriptures, God sends no one to hell. God sends no one to hell. People choose themselves. So I asked you, how could God send someone to hell? But a more accurate question would be, is why would anyone reject a good, loving father? Why are people rejecting? Are they rejecting because they've never met a Christian who really has a relationship with God? Are they hurt? See, God gives us free will. Like, I was just thinking, like, let's say you're in church and you see somebody on the other side of the room, maybe you're a dude, you see this beautiful young lady and it was worship and Pastor Derek was singing and you just, you saw the halo over her head, you know, and you just, (laughs) and like God just revealed to you, that's going to be my wife, you know, like you're just like, I'm going to, like you just have this like, this moment and so you approach this girl and she's not having it she's like no you're husky get out of here you know what I, mean? <laughs> I don't know but like you're a glutton for punishment and like you just keep coming back for more you know and she's just like not having it but like she's driving on 95 or god forbid she's on 76 and she she breaks down and she just thinks to herself, who's going to rescue me? And so she takes advantage of the fact that you love her and she knows it. So she calls you and your dumb as rock self shows up <laughs> on 76. It took you four hours to drive a mile. But you're there. And as you're there, as you're there, you're talking and you're changing the tire. And she's like, oh, maybe he's not so bad. He can change a tire. He got a job. Wow, I didn't know that. 
you don't have no kids, no baby mamas. Like, wow, there's really some... <laughs> Sorry, too far. And you're talking, you're there, you're stopped there for two, three hours, and you're just vibing. You're like, wow, maybe he's not so bad. And, and in your moment of need, you, you realize that maybe he was actually what you were looking for. And like, this is the picture of the gospel. That you didn't want God. You certainly didn't choose God. You didn't love God. But in his love for you, he kept pursuing you and chasing you down and in your moment where you were broken down and your life was falling apart you started to have a conversation you realized he was exactly what you were looking for he fulfills a need and a place in you and so you've now chosen to believe and chosen to live a life of love towards God see like it wouldn't be love if like I made my wife love me some days I gotta you know but <laughs> But like that wouldn't be love and like the gospel, the scriptures, the Bible is a love story. And it's not this Disney stupid love story where you kiss a rock or a frog or and like your prince shows up and like he's a beast and then he's beautiful. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, it's not that. It's like I hated God and I was an enemy of God and yet he kept chasing me down and choosing me and now because I've seen how good he is, I believe in him and I love him and I want him and I desire him. Do you understand the love story of the gospel? So where will I spend eternity? It's my choice, but I've chosen him because he chose me. And the problem is that so many of our friends and family and people in our city, they don't know. And they're broken down somewhere. And their life is falling apart. They act like they got it all together. But at night, in their apartment, or whatever they are, they're crying, they're weeping because there's a hole in their heart and you've got the answer. we doing about it God doesn't send people to hell in fact John 3 36 says whoever believes in the son is eternal life but whoever rejects the son will not see life for God's wrath remains on them in other words people actually don't go to hell for sin they go to hell for their unbelief like because I sinned this morning I'm sure of it I was mad in my heart. I wasn't feeling good. I just, I had a morning, okay? I know some of you fought on your way to church. You barely got here. You sinned. But here's the difference. It's not my sin that's sending me to hell because Christ already paid for all my sin. Like, what I believe is that when I confess my sin, he's faithful and just to forgive me and cleanse me of all my unrighteousness, that he throws my sin as far as the east is to the west, that I'm a new creation that's in Christ Jesus. The old is gone, the new is here. He puts a new song in my mouth. Do you understand what I believe I receive? So the whole point I'm making is where will you spend eternity? The question is, do you believe? And here's the proof of belief. Proof of belief is that eventually you'll change because the proof of belief is within transformed behavior. In other words, because I'm transformed, I love. And because I'm transformed, I serve. And because I'm transformed, I give. And because I'm transformed, I invite. And because I'm transformed, my heart is broken over hell. Because I'm transformed, I change. Because I'm transformed, I'm pursuing Jesus. Because I'm transformed, all of these things begin to change in my life. And it doesn't always happen overnight, but over time, God's doing a work in me because I'm transformed. I either believe or I reject, but the proof of my my belief is that my behavior has changed. Do you believe? Where are you going to spend eternity has everything to do with what you believe, not about how much you've sinned because the worst of the sinners, the worst of the worst, this seat's for them because that seat was for you. God is not afraid of sin. He defeated sin. He stepped on the neck of sin. God just going, I want to offer you love. Will you receive it? God doesn't send people to hell. The rejection of his mercy does. Which brings me to my final question. Where will the people in your life whom you love, where will they go when they die? Where will they go when they die? And guys, stay with me and look at me, please. This is why we do this one block at a time thing. If you're a guest here today, our mission 
is to put as many local churches in as many neighborhoods as possible. And we're not doing this to become famous or large or wealthy or any of these things. Like, that's not, we're doing this because of the urgency and the commandment to go and make disciples to go and see people transformed and renewed. We believe that a church in every neighborhood, on every corner, on every block, we believe that that's actually gonna transform a city to meet its potential. We believe that there are consequences, that actually there is eternity in glory with God or these eternity separated from God. We believe this stuff, so we are aggressive in saying we are always multiplying. We're not trying to push to push. We got one life. And your friends matter to me, and my friends matter to me, and your family matters to me, and I hope your family matters to you and your neighbors and your coworkers. And there's an empty seat with their name on it. Where will those people that you claim you love go when they die? And don't claim that you love people if you're not broken by the thought of hell. Heaven needs to be in our soul, but hell needs to be on our minds. Don't tell me that you love people if you've never invited them and offered them the good news. God's heart, it beats for souls. Somebody committed suicide as I snapped my finger. Somebody died. Somebody was born. God's heart. God's heart is not beating for church people to get spiritually fat. God's heart is beating for church people to be spiritually fit and to get up off their butts and invite somebody to sit with them. Can I have two more minutes? Just this side over here. I want to read you three more things. Charles Spurgeon said this. He said this. He said, think lightly of hell and you will think lightly of the cross. Guys, there's no point in the cross if we're not being saved from hell. Think little of the sufferings of lost souls and you will soon think little of the Savior who delivers you from them. He's the Savior of what? Paul writes in Philippians, he says, for I told you often before and I'll say it again with tears. He's broken. With tears in my eyes that there are many whose conduct shows they are really enemies of the cross. With tears in my eyes. When's the last time your heart broke for lost people? And Jesus is telling the story of a rich man who was in hell in Luke. And the reason he uses the rich man is because his wealth was his God. His wealth was his security. And he wouldn't help anybody. And he gives this illustration of him in hell and he says, then the rich man said, please, Father Abraham, at least send him to my father's home. For I have five brothers and I want him to warn them so they don't end up in this place of torment. Stay with me. Here's the rich man. Go on, please. Can I just tell my five brothers so that they don't end up here? And the reality is, is everybody at every location that hears my voice right now, you're still breathing, which means you still have a purpose. And those five brothers that are far from God or those five sisters or those five friends or those five neighbors, like they're still alive and you're still breathing. Like let's not get to eternity. Let's not get to the place where it's over, where somebody's gone and we regret that we didn't invite them to sin with us that we didn't offer the gospel like that's why I'm here I'm not here to make church a country club where they do what I want when I want it how I want it no I literally our church exists to see people cross from death to life so that we would share in the seat that we were so freely and undeservedly given do you believe because if you do let me be broken What will happen to your friends, to your family who you say you love that don't know God? Here's what I want to do. Every location, every person, I want you to grab those invite cards, those sit with them cards. I want you to stand to your feet, nobody moving, as little movement as possible. Grab them, grab them, grab them, grab them. Hold them. Come on, let's close our eyes and let's thank Holy Spirit who belongs in that chair. 
who belongs in that chair next week as we present the gospel, as we give t-shirts away and as we, as we creatively tell some stories. But at the end of the day, when we share the good news, who needs to be sitting with us? We hold those cards in our hands. Would you pray with me, church, every person? Father, right now in Jesus' name, break our heart for what breaks yours. Father, right now, I pray that you would stir in, uh, stir up in us a hunger to see you move in the lives of our friends and our family members and those who are far from you. God, right now, I pray that you would put specific names on our heart, that you would begin to soften hearts of people that we need to invite to hear the good news. Father, right now, I pray stir up in us like never before. Break our hearts for what breaks yours. We're praying for revival in in our city. We're praying for revival to sweep across our nation. God, use your people. Use your church. God, we want you, Jesus, to reveal yourself to our friends and our family like never before. We are submitted and we trust you. God, have your way in Jesus' name. Come on, everybody said amen. Let's give God a praise today.